Hey guys, welcome to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is Mendel's experiments and the laws of probability. Um, it's basically like an intro into a genetics course, so if you know you're going to have to take a genetics course in the future, you might really pay attention to this chapter. <clears throat> so, it took the scientific community a little while to catch on to how genes worked and how they were passed, or even what genes were. Um, in 1868, Darwin proposed uh, the pangenesis theory. And the pangenesis theory said that pangenes, or gemules, basically pieces of your body, pieces of all of your body, would collect and form into eggs and sperm, and that that would be transferred to your offspring. Um, in the 1600s, Van Leeuwenhoek um, came up with this idea that the mother was actually only an incubator for the child, and that actually the father provided, who provided sperm um, actually provided a miniature human inside of his sperm called a, a humunculus. And then a little bit later on, they decided that the humunculus was actually contained in the egg and that the sperm just then stimulated the growth of that humunculus. Uh, by the 1700s, they at least were kind of catching on and they accepted this blending theory, which said that both parents contribute equally to the characteristics of the offspring. However, it's a blending of those characteristics that produces the offspring. So, for example, a man with black hair uh, and a woman with blonde hair have a child, then that child would then have blonde hair, or, um, excuse me, brown hair by that logic. So, as we know, this is not the case. This is not how it works. And in the 1800s, Mendel decided to start doing uh, some experiments on pea plants. And through that, he was able to discover the gene. So what Mendel did was he did controlled self-pollinated and cross-pollinations of pea plants and was able to devise mathematical and statistical models which explain the, hair, the patterns of inheritance that we see. So through these experiments, he was also able to discover the existence of what he called inheritable factors, which we now know are genes. Um, these genes are able to retain their individuality through generations, even though the offspring may not look exactly like the, parent, the parents did. So Mendel didn't just happen upon the garden pea to use for his experiments. He chose it for several different reasons. So the first being that it's a true breeding species, meaning that it will self-pollinate and produce offspring that are always exactly like the parent. Another reason he chose this plant is because it'll mature within one season and it'll produce large quantities of peas within that one season. The third reason he chose it is because it exhibits discontinuous variation within its traits. In other words, <clears throat> the traits that it possesses are inherited with distinct characteristics. They are one thing or another. There's no blending between the two things. So, for example, um, a plant could have violet or white flowers. They could have smooth or wrinkled seeds. So, as I said, these plants are self-pollinating. And the way this happens is because... The anthers that are within this flower <coughs> um, produce pollen that are then received by the stigma and transported ported to the ovule. The way it's set up is as soon as this plant is fertilized, it'll close up so tightly that other pollen won't be able to get in there. So they always self-pollinate. They'll always be exactly like the parent was. So the way that Mendel was able to remedy this in cases uh, or in parts of the experiment that he didn't want them to self-fertilize was he would cut off the immature stamens of, the, of these plants and then he would manually dust the, the female plants with pollen. And he, <clears throat> the way you do this is you take like a paintbrush or a similar object and take pollen from one plant and dust it on the on the stamen of the other plant. Then these 
you've successfully fertilized those plants. So the way he went about his experimental method is he, he produced true breeding strains for a trait that he was studying and he allowed those to self fertilize so that he was 100% sure they were true breeding strains. And then he cross fertilized two true breeding strains um, to see what forms, of, other forms of that trait may be exhibited in those hybrids. So then after that, he would allow those hy hybrid offspring to self fertilize for several generations and count the number of offspring that showed each form of that trait. So with these pea plants, Mendel was looking at seven different traits. He was looking at flower color, seed color, seed texture, pod color, pod shape, flower uh, position, and the plant height. And again, these were traits that had uh, one or the other characteristics. So purple or white flowers, yellow or green seeds, round or wrinkled seeds. So his first cross, so he crossed two true breeding strains, a purple flower plant and a white flower plant. And the resulting offspring were all purple. The white characteristic had completely disappeared. So he again crossed that F1 generation and the resulting F2 generation had both purple flowers and white flowers. In fact, that three quarters of those plants were purple flowered and one quarter of those plants were white flowered. So he allowed that generation, the F2 generation, to self pollinate. <clears throat> and what he actually had was um, one true breeding dominant plant to two non true breeding dominant plants and one um, true breeding recessive plant. And so to explain this, we're going to uh, backtrack a little bit and go over the five element model. So number one, parents transmit discrete factors. Now we know that they are called genes. Two, each individual will receive a copy of each gene from each parent. So you'll have a copy of both of them from each parent, right? Not all of these copies of the gene are going to be identical. So alleles would be alternative forms of a gene. Uh, if you have homozygous alleles, that would be two of the same gene, and heterozygous would be two different alleles. So let's look at this. Here we have a chromosome. We can say that this is potentially a dog, a chromosome for a dog. <clears throat> and on the left, it received one copy of the chromosome from its first parent. The other side is parent two. So, each of these little individual lines on these chromosomes are known as alleles. When those two are the same, it's said to, that you have a homozygous allele. So you have the same copy of that allele from both parents. If you got different types of alleles from your parents, you have heterozygous alleles for that. So continuing with the five element model, number four, your alleles will remain discrete, meaning that they're passed from each generation without alteration. They will always be that same allele, even if the, the offspring looks different or they're exhibiting something different. And five, the presence of that allele does not guarantee the expression. So you can have a dominant allele that may be expressed all the time, or a recessive allele that may be there but can be hidden. What I mean by that is you can have a person, let's say, um, <clears throat> with curly hair. Um, so we have these two alleles for curly hair, or for hair expression. So you have a big C, capital C, for curly, and a lowercase c for straight. If you had a person who has two of the dominant genes for curly hair, then they would have curly hair expression. If you had a person who had a dominant curly gene and a recessive, so lowercase, um, 
gene for straight hair, then they would still exhibit the curly hair. If you had a person who had two recessive genes for straight hair, then they would express the straight hair. So these heterozygous people with two different alleles <clears throat> can still produce offspring with um, straight hair, but they themselves will always express that they have curly hair. So that's why it's important to <clears throat> understand the difference between genotype and phenotype. Genotype is a term for an organism's underlying genetic makeup. That what they consist of both what visibly and the non-expressed alleles as well. The phenotype is the observable traits expressed by an organism. So what you can see about them. They have brown hair. They have brown eyes. They, uh, there's just things that you can see about that organism. That's their phenotype. So when you're trying to predict the potential outcome of a breeding or the crossing of two organisms. Say you have dogs that you want to breed and you want to predict what color coat they have. You might want to use a Punnett square, which is a diagram used just for such to predict the outcomes of particular crosses or breedings. Um, so for a monofibred cross, uh, that would be a cross between two true breeding parents that differ only in one characteristic you would have a square that has four potential outcomes for offspring. On the top of that, you would have the genetic contribution of one parent. And on the first um, column, you would have the genetic contribution of another parent. So <clears throat> you can see how it's split up right here. And we're going to do one. So we're going to take the same curly versus straight hair example that we used before. So we're going to take someone who has uh, is homozygous for the dominant curly hair gene. Then we're going to take someone who is homozygous for the straight hair gene and see what the potential offspring may have. So whenever you do this, you just line up each, uh, <coughs> each gene and see and then put the resulting combination below. So you have a big C from this parent and a little C from this parent. See? And then you do the same thing. Big C, little C. And that's what it's going to be for all of them. So all of their children would have curly hair, but they would all be heterozygous. So let's see what, let's take those kids, or one of those kids. So we're going to put the heterozygous child, and let's say that they also married a heterozygous for curly-haired person. And their children, can you match them? So big C, big C, big C, little C, big C, little C, oops, and two little C's. So here we would have one quarter of the offspring heterozygous for curly hair. I'm sorry, homozygous for curly hair. We would have one half of their offspring being heterozygous for curly hair. So they would also have curly, curly haired children, or those would be curly haired children. Then you would also have a quarter of their children with, oops, with the homozygous straight hair. So three quarters, curly hair, one quarter, um, straight hair. If we were to take the same Punnett square and apply it to two different traits, so a dihybrid cross, because most often you're not going to find organisms that only have one trait different between the two. So we're going to say um, homozygous uh, dominant curly haired person and we're going to say, basically, you can have brown or green eyes in the world. You know, that's all you can have. So we're going to say this person has brown eyes. 
and they're homozygous for brown eyes. They are going to have children who is homozygous for having straight hair and who has green eyes. So they are homozygous for uh, the recessive gene. So whenever you set a Punnett square up like this, it's just going to have four times the number of possibilities. So you're going to have 16 potential outcome squares. So you take your parents and you're going to have to combine them every possible way that you can. So you get every combination for that parent and put them across the top and do the same for the other. And then again, you do the same concept, big C, little C, big B, little B, which is what it's going to be for every single one of these. Okay, like that. <clears throat> so if you need a close up on how I am combining these parents, let me zoom in. Okay, so we'll take the same first parent. Okay, so you can have match him to the first B, and you can match that C to the second B. You can take the second C and match it to the first B, and then also match it to the second B so that you're getting every possible combination from that parent that you can, which in this case is all just homozygous for the dominant trait. Okay, so now let's take a look at Mendel's experiment again within the Punnett square. So on the top we have a homozygous recessive parent for white flowers, and on the left we have a homozygous dominant parent for purple flowers. So the resulting four options for offspring are all the same. You will end up with a heterozygous, heterozygous purple flowered plant. If we were to take uh, that F1 generation and cross two heterozygotes for the purple flowers, you end up with basically the same situation we were talking about with curly or straight hair. So you end up with uh, one quarter of the offspring having homozygous dominant genes for the purple flowers, uh, one half of the offspring for heterozygous purple flowers, and then a quarter of the offspring with white homozygous recessive genes, or white flower homozygous recessive genes for purple flowers. So um, before we continue with this, at the end of this video, or if you want to take a pause and take a look at this Mendelian genetics video, it will help you out as well. Okay, now we're going to get into the probability of uh, a certain genetic trait being expressed or passed. And um, so probabilities are the mathematical measure of likelihood. And there are a couple of different types of probabilities that you may have heard of or uh, you need to be aware of at the least. Um, so we have empirical probabilities, which are probabilities that come from observations or um, events that have already happened. So um, the empirical probability of an event is calculated by dividing the number of times that event occurs by the total number of opportunities for that event to occur. So these are things that are already known data that you can apply probability to. Uh, so another type of probability that we need to talk about is theoretical probability. So um, this is a type of probability that comes with predicting an outcome, knowing something about the event and being able to produce a fairly reliable um, prediction or probability of what will happen. 
So that's the type of probability that we're going to talk about. So what is the probability of this future event happening and producing ABC results, right? Okay. So the two types of theoretical probabilities that we're going to talk about are the product rule and the sum rule. And these will be the most applicable to you for this section. Okay, so the first rule we're going to cover is the product rule. The product rule applies to probabilities that are going to try to predict the outcome of two independently occurring events that are happening simultaneously. So what that means is that the events have the outcome of these events have no bearing on the outcome of the other event. So say you were going to roll a six-sided die and flip a penny at the same time. There, neither one of those can affect the outcome of the other. So those are the types of events that we can apply the product rule to. The probability of these two events occurring together can be calculated by multiplying the individual probabilities of each event occurring alone. So let's take a look at our first example here. What is the probability of John and Linda getting heads after tossing a coin? So, the individual probabilities here, John has a 1 in 2 chance of getting heads. He also has a 1 in 2 chance of getting tails. Same for Linda. 1 in 2 chance of heads, 1 in 2 chance for tails. So, you're going to take the probability of those events happening independently, 1 in 2 for John and 1 in 2 for Linda, and multiply them to get 1 in 4. So you have a 25% chance of John and Linda getting heads after tossing a coin. Now let's take a look at the second example down here. So when crossing a heterozygous for purple flower parent with another heterozygous for purple flower parent, the probability of their offspring being heterozygous for the recessive white flower is what? So you take the probability of obtaining a recessive gene from the father, which is one half because that it has two alleles and one half of them are recessive. And then the same from the mother, one half of her alleles are also recessive. And then you multiply one half by one half to get one fourth. So you have a one in four chance of getting a heterozygous, um, excuse me, a homozygous recessive offspring for the white flower. Now let's talk about the sum rule. So the sum rule can be applied when you're trying to predict the probability of two mutually exclusive events occurring simultaneously. So what that means is that uh, the outcome can come about through multiple pathways. So let's take a look at this first example. What is the probability that a head will be obtained when John and Linda toss a coin? So John has a 1 in 2 chance of getting a tails and a 1 in 2 chance of getting heads. Same for Linda. So let's take a look at all of the possible outcomes. The outcomes could be that they both roll or uh, excuse me flip a tails or uh, <clears throat> John could roll a tails and Linda could roll heads or Linda, uh, John could roll heads and Linda could roll tails or they could both roll heads. So you have a one in four probability for each of those things happening. So in three of those categories, they end up with heads, which is the original question. What's the probability that one head will be obtained when they both toss a coin? So you're going to add these probabilities. So uh, one and a quarter plus one and a quarter plus one and a quarter is a probability of three out of four of those, the potential outcomes could result in a heads. So let's look at the second example and how it's applied when we're looking at it from a genetic point of view. So if we were to cross two heterozygotes for purple flowers, the probability of producing a heterozygote for purple flower is what? So, <clears throat> From, for this example, I want you to kind of picture a Punnett square. So you have four potential outcomes 
for that Punnett square, correct? So you have a one in four chance of getting a big P little p in that lineup. Plus, you're gonna add it to the probability of the same thing, it's just reverse, little p, big P. So one in four plus one in four is a one in two chance of getting a heterozygote offspring out of two heterozygote parents. Now we kind of went over uh, dihybrid crosses already. Um, so again, this is when you're crossing two true breeding lines for two traits. Um, so there's two, the, the parents have two differences in traits. Um, the main thing I want you to get out of this slide is that the alleles for each gene will assort independently. Again, like we were talking about, it if the assortment for one gene occurs, then it has no bearing on the assortment for the next one. They're completely independent of one another. So let's take a look at that um, in the form of an example. So if we were to cross two tree, true breeding plants, one with uh, round yellow seeds and one with wrinkled green seeds, the resulting F1 generation of offspring will all be heterozygous for both of those traits. So they, but they will all exhibit the yellow round seed. If we were to cross a plant from that F1 generation with another plant from that F1 generation, the resulting phenotype would be as you see here. So <clears throat> nine out of 16 of the offspring would have yellow round seeds, three out of 16 of the offspring would have green round seeds, and three out of 16 offspring would also have yellow wrinkled seeds. And then one out of 16 would be the fully recessive um, homozygous genes, so uh, green wrinkled seeds. One in 16 would have green wrinkled seeds. Now that we've gone over um, the typical dominance and recessive patterns, I'm going to talk about a few abnormalities to that. So one of those would be incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance occurs when um, the expression of two contrasting alleles results in an individual that has an intermediate phenotype. So um, a great example of this is the snapdragon. So if you were to cross a homozygous parent with white flowers with a homozygous parent with red flowers, then they'll produce a heterozygous offspring with pink flowers. So it won't, ex it won't display the phenotype of either of its parents. It'll have that intermediate pink flower. Uh, another variation on uh, the normal dominance recessive patterns would be codominance. Uh, codominance means that both alleles for, a same for the same characteristic will be simultaneously expressed in the heterozygote. So both of those alleles will retain some sort of expression. So an example of this would be in humans, uh, the MN blood group. So the M and N alleles are both expressed in the form of an M and N antigen that's present on the surface of red blood cells. The homozygous express either the M or the N allele, but heterozygotes express both of the alleles equally. Now we're gonna talk about um, when there are many different types of alleles for the same gene. Um, a lot of this can be seen in the variations that can be derived from wild animals. So a lot of times you'll have the wild type standard form. So in bunnies, the normal brown bunny that you see everywhere. However, there can be many different variations, even if they're very rare. So the variant is the deviation from that standard. And we can take a look at <clears throat> these rabbits down here. The wild top would be brown fur. However, there are several of these different variants, the chinchilla or the Himalayan or the albino, all of which can be found in the wild population just at very low numbers. Now we're going to talk about X like linked traits and in order to do that we need to talk a little bit about the sex chromosomes. 
So sex chromosomes are your non-homologous set of chromosomes that determine what sex you'll be. So if you're gonna, if you're a male, you will have an X and Y, uh, one X chromosome from your mom and one Y chromosome from your dad. So you have X and Y. And then if you're a female, you'll have two X's. You'll have received an X from your dad and an X from your mom as well. So these contrast in comparison with autosomes. So these are all of the rest of your non-sex chromosomes, which are all homologous. So uh, when we're talking about an X-linked trait. Um, this is a gene that's present on the X chromosome, but is not present on the Y chromosome. So for example, uh, in Drosophila, which is a type of fly, the wild type of eye color is red, and it's dominant to the white eye color. However, because it's a sex-linked trait, it will be overexpressed in the males of the population because they only have one X chromosome. So they, they don't get the option to have the dominant white, I mean, excuse me, the dominant red eyes because all they have is one chromosome for the recessive red, uh, white eyes, excuse me. So <clears throat> on the top of this Punnett square, we have the female's gametes. So she is homozygous for the recessive trait of, of uh, white eyes. And the male is, he's got his X and Y chromosome, but he is a, he has the dominant red form of eyes. So these offspring will result in all female offspring with red eyes and all male offspring with white eyes. Because again, he had to have gotten his X chromosome from his mom because he had to receive the Y chromosome from his dad in order to become a male. So in the case of the Drosophila with eye color, it may not be imperative to their survival to maintain the dominant red eye. However, there are traits that are sex linked that can be can greatly affect someone's health. So this is why it can be problematic in humans especially. So <clears throat> we're gonna take a look at a couple of human sex linked disorders. So in this case, there's not um, a name disorder, but we're going to say that there is some sort of an X-linked disorder. Um, so here we have an unaffected father. He's got uh, the dominant normal allele, and then we have a female who is unaffected. She's heterozygous for carrying this X-linked recessive allele, and they have children. So their children, they will have a one in four chance of having an unaffected son receiving the X chromosome from his, uh, receiving the unaffected X chromosome from his mother and then the unaffected Y from his father. They will also have a one in four chance of getting an unaffected daughter receiving the unaffected dominant allele from the mother and the father. And then they will have an affected son because again, he had to receive his Y chromosome from his father, which is unaffected. And he got the recessive link from his mother. So he only has one X chromosome, so he must express that trait. And then they will also have a one in four chance of having a daughter that is unaffected, but it is a carrier for the X link trait. So an example of, oops, i pull this back down. An example of an X-linked tra trait in humans is hemophilia. So we're going to take a look at this example, if I can get it to fit the screen, that is. Okay, so here we have, we're going to take a look at this left one. <clears throat> we have an unaffected father and a mother that is a carrier for the hemophilia disease. And so hemophilia is a disease, it's a hereditary um, disease that affects the, the clotting of a person's blood. So most often they lack some sort of a coagulation factor, so they're not able to clot whenever, uh, whenever they have an injury that causes bleeding. So 
Here we have unaffected mother, I mean unaffected father, and a mother that's a carrier but is unaffected. They have offspring. They'll have a one in four chance for having a son that's unaffected, a one in four chance of having a daughter that's a carrier, a one in four chance of having a son that actually explays he, um, explay, displays the hemophilia phenotype, and a daughter that is also unaffected. If we were to have uh, kind of the opposite over here, and we have a father with hemophilia and a mother that has um, both of the dominant normal, what we're calling the standard allele for, for non-hemophilia, and they have children. So they would have a one in four chance of, or excuse me, a one in two chance of having two sons that are completely unaffected because their father's X chromosome is what had the hemophilia. So he couldn't pass that to his sons because they had to take his, X, his Y chromosome. But their, the resulting daughters that they could potentially have would both be carriers because they had to get their other X chromosome from their father. Okay, well, that concludes this chapter. I uh, hope you all found some interesting stuff in there. Um, I really encourage you to take a genetics class if it ever fills the requirement for you or you have an elective that you can take a genetics course for. You'll definitely learn a lot and delve a little bit deeper into predicting some of these things and learn a little bit more about some interesting traits.